Well, this morning, we're going to do something a little bit different today. And uh, one of our rhythms here at Bellingham Covenant Church in the post-Easter season is to focus on mission. One of the things we notice in Matthew 28 is that their resurrection account ends with this commission to go out into the world, to make disciples, to share this hopeful word with others. And uh, today, I'm going to invite Justin Maddox up. And Justin, you can come join us. One of uh, the things that Justin has been involved in is an important recovery outreach in our community. And today, in place of a a normal sermon, we're going to do kind of like a live podcast feel where I'm going to interview Justin. I'm so grateful for Justin. And those of you who know Justin just know his passion, his heart for God, his heart for the scriptures. And every time we talk, I'm inspired. And so we just want to bring this conversation public today and talk about some of the things that God is doing in his life and in the, some of the outreach work he is doing. And so welcome, Justin. I'm going to pray for our time and, uh, and we're going to just engage and listen to what's on your heart today. So let's pray. God, we're grateful for the way that you have empowered the whole people of God into ministry and that you've uh, called us to be the priesthood of all believers. I'm so grateful for Justin uh, that in the midst of his work as a contractor, he is a, a minister of the gospel and that he is uh, involved in your work in the community. And so we thank you. Lord, we pray that you would be lifted up in our conversation, that your word would be lifted up, that we might be listening and noticing for the ways your resurrected power is working itself out in our midst and in our community. Bless Justin as he speaks. I pray that the words of his mouth, uh, the meditations of our hearts would bring joy to you as we reflect on what you are doing in our midst. Uh, So we praise you and give you the glory for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, Justin. Good to have you. Good to have you here. Um, So yeah, let's just dive right into it and tell us a little bit about the ministry uh, you have for people in recovery. Sure. Um, I want to say this word's really timely. I just picked up the Sunday paper and those in the medical uh, care see that uh, the rate of overdoses has nearly doubled in the last two years. And so um, I'm grateful that God's inspired our conversation, our conversation here. Today, yeah, uh, yeah my, my own personal uh, piece of jumping into the recovery ministry uh, of recently, I've done quite a bit of work, but was actually, I got approached after I had um, been working at the Lighthouse Mission and that job ended. I got approached by Galen Johnson, who's a part of our fellowship. And he patiently prodded me, and he said, Justin, there's such a need, even in our own churches, um, particularly there's a need for uh, care in the area of uh, sexual addictions. And so that wasn't the type of ministry I was looking for, (laughs) and I was patiently waiting for God to give me a second option. Uh, (laughs) But uh, at some point, I, I felt God just say, you know what? Will you say yes, you know? And um, without anybody else hearing, I said yes to God. And it was interesting that within the next 24 hours, I got a separate person, separate phone call. Um, my old boss talking about a former coworker. Hey, this guy, you know, he's just experienced the failure uh, that he's brought on his own marriage and the damage it's done. And he's not the same guy. He's really broken. He's really humble. Can I give him your phone number? <laughs> mm-hmm. And knowing people in recovery, I was like, sure, he's not going to call me. <laughs> so, low risk. Yeah, low risk. I could say yes. I said yes, and I got a phone call. And so that, right in, you know, this was COVID. Everything was shut down. We weren't meeting anywhere, um, and yet there was this need. So we started meeting outside. Um, and it started with a group of three. And right now we're about eight to 12 guys. We meet at the Lighthouse Mission now. Um, 7 a.m. on Saturday mornings. So, Awesome. Yeah. Great. Grateful for your responsiveness to those nudges. And uh, tell us just a little bit more about what's drawn you to this type of ministry as you've engaged in this. What's, what's drawn you to this work? Yeah. yeah, I think my simple answer is Jesus' presence, and I, I don't want to make the Sunday school version of that, but it's interesting how the burning bush could be on fire and not burn out. And it was because God's presence was there. And ministry will burn you out if it isn't for God's presence. And so 
Um, this type of work I'm drawn to it because for me, uh, the presence of God is, it's a thin space where I experience, sometimes I experience more of his presence there. And this isn't judgment, this is just how God's made me. More there than in like a Sunday service even, right? And so it's that kind of connection that, that uh, keeps me coming back. Yeah. You know, in our conversations, we've talked a bit about the mutual transformation that happens. So uh, we're we both in reading a book by Greg Boyle right now, uh, chaplain to gang members. And he has this thought about how, as he steps into those places, it's not just to make a difference, but to be made different. Mm -hmm. And he's experienced just his own transformation. So can you share a little bit about kind of the mutual transformation that you've experienced in this type of work? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I heard an African proverb that for me um, summarizes my own journey. Um, in the recovery world, if, if you haven't struggled with uh, chemical or alcohol addictions, uh, the name for you is a normie. <laughs> You're a normie. And so that's my journey. I'm a normie. I grew up as a missionary kid. Um, and so in some ways, this is an unusual journey for me. Um, but in Africa, they have this proverb. It says, when I saw you from afar, I thought you were a monster. When you got closer, I thought you were an animal. When you got even closer... I saw that you were a human, but when we were face to face, I realized you were my brother. And that's been my journey. I, as a normie, uh, it can be easy to think that there is a big divide between us and them. Um, and Mother Teresa talks about finding Jesus in distressing disguise in her work with the poor. I would twist that and say you also find yourself in distressing disguise. Hmm. And so you end up seeing yourself in an alcoholic. You end up seeing yourself in a, a sex offender. You end up seeing yourself in someone struggling with meth. And, um, and then as that happens, so uh, to bring it home, back in 2010, I was down in Madras, Oregon. And I started to identify that what fuels a lot of addiction, and addictions, there's layers. You can talk about the body. You can talk about the spirit relationships. But one aspect of it is that there's this common thread that addiction is um, a drive to avoid hard things. Maybe it's memories, uh, feelings, uh, and thoughts. And as I'm kind of coaching people, <laughs> you know, the light bulb goes off. Oh, that's me. <laughs> I was a single guy, and uh, one of the things I had to work through was uh, relational vulnerability and, and the fear of failure. And so it involved a girl you might know named Megan, <laughs> Megan Howe at the time. And uh, with the encouragement of a close mentor, um, I realized God was inviting me to reconsider the risk of pursuing her. And I don't think without seeing the courage uh, in people in recovery that I'm, I would have had the courage perhaps uh, to make that risk and end up marrying this awesome gal that we love. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing the ways that... Uh... Yeah, this has been formative for you. One thing you shared in our conversations, and you referenced it a little bit already, is just that uh, you've encountered some authenticity in recovery spaces that is sometimes a refreshing space, and maybe more so than in other com Christian communities. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, my friend would say stuff like, uh, this is not for condemnation, but for identification, when he would, you know, bring up uh, you know, a, a loving confrontation, you know, sometimes. And I think that's how Jesus works with us, too. So this is the same heart. But um, in working with people, especially on the street level, uh, we kind of have the privilege of being able to hide our messes, <laughs> right? We, we can shut that garage door and pull into our house and pull the shades or whatever. We can show up dressed nice or whatever, right? Uh, but on a street level, um, your mess is on your outside. And so uh, you already can't hide it. And so it actually um, kind of, that's actually the gift. Um, it's easier in some senses for people that can't hide it to be real. And that's refreshing for me. I mean, we're all kind of used to church culture where it, it takes a lot to be real for some reason. And um, so that was a refreshing space for me. Uh, you've probably heard uh, the words like fallen from grace. You guys have heard that. Um, I think... When I've heard it, it's only been out of context. It's actually a scripture. There's a scripture in Galatians 
Um, and in Galatians, uh, the scripture isn't sp- speaking about the town drunk or the prostitute or uh, the pastor who had to resign because of moral uh, failure. Uh, fallen from grace is actually the Christians um, who, uh, in some senses, are, are trying to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. So God's begun a new work in their life, and now the Christian's going, it's up to me to finish this thing. <laughs> so the verse right here is Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. And uh, Paul writes, You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Isn't that a weird twist? We've twisted that. And, and here it is. Grace is when we say, you know what? It's all up to me. I'm going to finish the work that Jesus began. Um, and, and in those moments, we fall. So um, part of being real, too, I think, comes from the value of recognizing our powerlessness. So addictions, whether you're on the helping side or if you're the one struggling, uh, it bumps you into what doesn't feel like a gift. It feels like a curse. And, and the word is powerless. Um, but it's in recognizing our powerlessness to justify or heal or fix ourselves. Um, that's what keeps us from falling from grace. It pushes us into re- relationship and fellowship with Jesus and each other because um, you got nothing to prove and everything to gain at that point, right? So I think even that understanding of powerlessness as we see it in the gospel even will help free up Christians to be like, okay, yeah. I am a mess <laughs> with all the you. Mm-hmm. That reminds me of the story in the Gospels where there's the Pharisee and the tax collector, and the Pharisee's like, I'm glad I'm not like that man, God. I yeah. have my life together. And the sinner is just acknowledging his powerlessness and saying, Lord, have mercy upon me. And, and Jesus says, that's the one, that's the person who's closer to the kingdom of God. Yeah. Um, can you, can you share uh, just a little bit of some of the ways you've seen God and even maybe a si- signs mm-hmm. of the kingdom of God in these spaces? Yeah. Um, there's a, uh, you know, sometimes it's tricky to tr- try and share someone else's story with yeah. confidentiality and the trust that uh, needs to be built. But one of the joys for me is um, uh, our, our funny group looks to me like the kingdom of God. So we have we have the wealthy of our community and the homeless. We have the retired and we have the young. We have men who've grown up uh, their whole church, you know, church life going to Sunday uh, church. And then we've had men that have grown up most of their life behind bars. And so when I see that, uh, my heart gets excited. <laughs> Just a picture yeah. of the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, uh, back in February, um, our Mission Catalyst team provided some funding for a training for you and some of your leaders to be trained in what's called the Genesis Process. And just as a reminder to our congregation, we have uh, have set aside some funds to try and inspire and equip and invest in some grassroots missional initiatives in our midst. And this is one of the first projects that our team uh, helped fund. And uh, so I just thought it'd be helpful for us as a congregation to just hear a bit about what the Genesis process is, what, and maybe a couple insights that you gain from that training as you continue to go deeper in this work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first of all, you guys provided the funds, so I just want to say thank you that you've been partners with me in this already, and I'm grateful. Um, one of the sayings they uh, shared right at the beginning was that grace without competence leads to chaos. Hmm. And so uh, part of going through this training is g- gaining competence. Um, and so, and I, if you've been around a close relative friend in an addiction, you know the cyclone that can kind of circle uh, addictions and the chaos it brings. Mm-hmm. Um, there, I, I do want to show kind of the brain science because that's an aspect of care um, with addictions that um, broadens the understanding and empathy uh, for what's going on. And so um, here's one aspect of that. People aren't actually, they don't actually get addicted to drugs. You go, huh? Right? We think that like, you put drugs in yourself, that's what you're addicted to. Um, in, in layman's terms, uh, the drugs, they operate as like the agent that turns the faucet on in your brain for neurochemistry. Right? So you're really addicted to 
chemicals that are already in all your brains right here sitting in front of me today, right? So all those chemicals are ready to go, and the drugs turn the tap on or they plug the, they plug the drain. Um, and either way, those neurochemicals stack up. Um, and so the, the insight there is for normies that um, you don't need drugs to turn the tap on or to plug the drain. Uh, that's where uh, there's behaviors that can feed into the same stuff. Uh, these behaviors can include things that might be obvious, like uh, the sexual addictions, pornography, uh, illicit sex. Uh, anxiety can fall into this category, but I say fall into this category because there's other things that create anxiety too, right? We just want to recognize that. Um, there can be shopping addictions. Uh, codependency is like, I need you to be okay for me to feel okay about myself. And so codependent rescuing um, can actually be an aspect of us turning the faucet on. Anger, uh, you ask a heroin addict, hey, how much do you gotta take for me to just knock you in the face and you not feel anything? And uh, he'll tell you nearly enough to kill me, like almost on the edge. Mm -hmm. But you can have somebody hit you in the face if you're really angry and not feel it. And so, so there's a mechanism that turns the tap on. Um, and so, uh, yeah, workaholism. So that's a little bit of the neurochemistry. Uh, the other uh, brain fact, uh, a really easy brain thing you guys can do is if you make a fist, uh, this is like your frontal cortex, if you will. And if you were to kind of crack the shell and look inside, uh, the simple name is the lizard brain. Uh, there's the limbic system inside uh, your brain. If you will, the front is like the brakes. <laughs> And that's the gas, the limbic system's the gas. Um, there's a part of our brain that can steal control of um, our agency, and that part is the limbic system. It's designed to keep us alive. It's our survival uh, path. It's their survival mechanism. And so my, uh, my example as a young dad is like, I got a seven-year-old girl that likes nothing better than to hide and then jump out and scare me. And no matter what, I jump, right? I'm startled. You're still scared. I'm yeah. still scared. And what is that? That's my limbic brain protecting my other parts of my brain. But it's also stealing control of my thinking brain, my frontal cortex, my decision-making capacity. Mm -hmm. And even if I went to a seminar about why I shouldn't be scared of seven-year-old girls, <laughs> 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 man, I'd still jump. Right. I'd still jump. And so I share that to illustrate that addictions don't go away by just going to a seminar. You can't just go hear seven points on how to stop addictions, right? Hmm. Um, but that part of the brain, interestingly, is also, it carries emotional memories. Um, so you can have a painful experience as a child, and this part of the brain can't tell time. So maybe that happened 30 years ago. But if, if you were to, you know subconsciously bring those feelings, they, they feel like they're happening now or they're hap they happened recently, it's fresh. And so this kind of destroys the argument that time can heal wounds. Time doesn't heal wounds. Um, when we get relationally hurt, we end up putting kind of, if you will, a bookmark in that part of our brain. And that, that bookmark is there to, to protect our body. And so whenever we encounter people or situations they get anything close to that, our limbic system is now taking over and going, nope, we're gonna do three things. We're gonna either fight, we're gonna flight, or we're gonna freeze. Mm -hmm. And addictions offer that flight pathway, right? So addictions are the limbic system's easy, hey, I'm getting out of here, um, I'm gonna protect myself. So I knew some of that from my college experience, but the aha moment going through this uh, training was that that part of the brain can't be healed with a seminar. It's not teach, that kind of teaching that can touch that part of who we are. That part of the brain can only be healed through experiential learning. And I don't have enough time to explain some of the stuff we went through, but that aspect of the training was really powerful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that's powerful. And it just reminds me that you know, we are embodied beings, and so uh, we are people that believe in the incarnation, word made flesh. So. I just love this holistic idea of understanding how our brains work and how, um, how God can bring healing into those areas. 
We're going to talk a little bit about some of the ways God kind of is part of this process of healing. And the word process was really significant to me in the Genesis process. And you know, I think sometimes we have this assumption that as Christians, if we just pray enough, God will just snap his fingers and take, take things away, uh, remove the, the problem. And often, and, and we could probably just see this in our own experience, we can see this in Scripture, but God invites us into a process of transformation. And I just uh, wonder why you think God doesn't always work with the snap of the finger, and uh, how and why he uh, sometimes invites us into a process of change through process. Yeah. So. Yeah, I love that question, and it can have a lot of answers. Yeah, we could spend an hour on this one. <laughs> Some good theology stuff to dig into. Um, yeah, as I've had the privilege of having the front seat to a lot of transformation in lives. And what I've noticed about how God works with us is he's, he's not in a hurry to transform us. He's in a hurry to love us. He's in a hurry to love us. He's not in a hurry to transform us. He's very committed to transform us, but he's not in a hurry. The only time he's in a hurry is to love us, right? And so I think we kind of, it's hard to just be loved. <laughs> I want to be changed. It's hard just to be loved just as I am. Um, I've also noticed in my uh, yard, I don't know that much about growing things, but the things that are the strongest are the things that grow the slowest, right? And the things that are the weakest are the things that, you know, bummer, my lawn needs cut again. <laughs> you know, my dandelions are up. Uh, those are the things that grow the fastest, but they're, they're structurally the weakest. But man, my Douglas firs that stand 100 feet, I can't even tell you when I've seen them grow, <laughs> you know? And maybe it's the same, uh, same God that's patient with the trees, is patient with us. Um, the other simple things are like, if you want something new to grow, you have to first change the soil. And I think we tend to attack the addictions, but the the addictions are just the things that float on the top. And so uh, some of the soil, and you can look at this personally or even culturally, is isolation, um, secrets and lies, pride and shame. I always put those two together. Both are an exaggerated view of self, right? You show me a proud man, and I'll also show you a shame-filled man. You show me a shame-filled man, I'll show you a proud man. They always go together. They're just the opposite sides of a coin. Uh, and then finally, avoiding uh, fears, so those thoughts, memories, uh, experiences. Okay, and then the soil of recovery um, is very relational. It's, it's learning to trust God and others again, and it involves moving towards our fears and towards resolving them rather than away from them. I really enjoy this little fable that my mind goes to as I work with people in recovery. This one's uh, retold by Frank Johnson Pippin. It's kind of a funny story. A uh, guy in this, this is fictional. I don't want to say this is scripture. This is fictional. But he dies. He goes to heaven. <clears throat> he has a weird request. And he meets the gatekeeper and goes, you know, before I go in, could I just go visit hell for a second? Before I go, you know. So he goes, he goes to hell in this fictional fable. And what he sees there is there's all these banquet tables and they're stacked up with food fit for a king, just delicious, nutritious food. And, and then he notices all the guests, and they're just starving, and, and you know, their faces and their bodies are, are so weak. And then he looks, and they've got these six-foot-long utensils strapped to their hands and fingers, and they can't feed themselves. They're seated in front of the food, but they're starving. And he goes, this is enough. I, this is awful. I can't. So he goes up to heaven. And uh, he walks in, and he hears the laughter, and hears the joy, and he sees the tables. It's almost the same thing. He sees all these tables, and he sees these people with six-foot utensils strapped on their hands, and, and yet they're full of joy. And what they figure it out is they can't feed themselves, but, man, they can scoop up the food for the person next to them, and they can let the person next to them feed them. And so these people are just healthy um, and, and so that's kind of, for me, a picture of both addictions and recovery. Um, addictions is us trying to get our needs met 
without people and without God. And all of us were born with needs that we couldn't meet. <laughs> right? We, Mom, whatever. And even as adults, although we try to mask that, that doesn't go away. Um, but then recovery is really a team sport. I've never seen anybody recovery, recover in isolation. Uh, and it also, yeah, it involves allowing others and God to meet our needs. An- another way of describing trust is allowing yourself to be loved. Allowing yourself. Yeah. 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 And, and just that posture. Yep. That's great. It reminds me of John 15 where Jesus says, like, apart from me, you can do nothing. Mm-hmm. And your, your invitation is to abide in my love so that you can bear the, bear the good. That's the work we're called to. Yeah. There's a pastor at Mandy Smith, and she says, we ricochet between. It's all up to me, and it's all up to God. And neither of those require much engagement relationally with God, mm-hmm. right? It's just, both are just, like, yeah. disconnected. And so I hear part of this call to recovery is that humble posture of I need, God. I need to mm-hmm. make room for God to allow his love to abide within me so that we can bear that, that fruit that we're longing for. Yeah. Um, let's, let's just go a little deeper with that about what the process by which God works to transform us. And we'll kind of end with that, sure. um, that question. The process. Um, yeah, I, I've recently kind of put these words together to make sense of my Bible as I read Romans. <laughs> but I, what I see is reconciliation, right? That's a relational word. Reconciliation always comes before transformation. Um, and so I, another really short story, this one is, takes place in Madrid, but a father gets estranged from a son who wants to be a matador. And the son's name is Paco, which is a very common name at the time of the story. And the father goes on a hunt for Paco. He can't find him. He goes through the streets. No Paco. Uh, months go by. Finally, he decides, I'll do this. I'll publish in the newspaper an ad. And in the ad, uh, he writes, Paco, all is forgiven. Meet me on Tuesday in front of Hotel Montana. Love, Papa. Right? And so then Tuesday rolls around, and Papa goes there. And he's looking for his Paco. And instead of one Paco, 800 Pacos show up. <laughs> 800 Pacos. But, but I think that expresses, like, our biggest need in any minute of any day isn't behavior change. Our biggest need is reconciliation with God. Um, and one way I think about this, like, Isaiah says, we all... Our biggest problem isn't a behavior problem, it's a relational problem. Isaiah says, For we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And as I read Romans, it seems like if we unplug ourselves from God, our human soul, uh, destructive behavior just ends up coming out of us. We were never meant to unplug from God. As humans, we were meant to be plugged into the source of love at all times. Um, I just want to end with one of my personal favorite verses, uh, Jeremiah 3.22, speaking to me of my own wayward heart. (laughs) Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Mm -hmm. Um, Jeremiah 3.22 says, My wayward children, says the Lord, come back to me and I will heal your wayward hearts. And the people say, yes, we're coming. The people reply, for you are the Lord. So the cure for a wayward heart, come back to me and I will heal your wayward hearts. And so uh, how this works out practically for me is when my wayward heart wanders, I have to kind of be my own shepherd. I have to go after that black sheep and bring it back. Sit, stay. (laughs) And then when it wanders again, I have to go after my wayward heart, bring it back into the presence of Jesus, sit, stay. And when it wanders again, right, you get the picture. It, it's an ongoing, but th- that process of returning to the Lord, and it's the same Jesus that, you know, reinstated Peter, you know, after he had denied him. It's, it's the same Jesus that said, hey, you, you can touch my wounds, doubting Thomas, you know. Um, it's the same Jesus. And so, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Justin, for sharing, and uh, just 
want to acknowledge in the room, I think a lot of what you're naming is relevant to all of our story in one way or another. And uh, I appreciate just how you mentioned the leveling of the foot below the cross that we all in our own ways struggle. And I just want to reach out to those of you who maybe feel a little bit isolated in your journey uh, to know that there are people here that want to come alongside you. Please feel free to reach out to myself or to Justin. And um, yeah, we just thank you, Justin, for your heart, your faithfulness. I want to pray for you. And then uh, grateful that we can then come to the table and just meditate on a God who wants to welcome all of us again in grace and in mercy today. So let's pray. God, I thank you for the way you are uh, working in Justin's life, for his passion for your word, his heart for others. Lord, we thank you ultimately uh, for the way your love has been lifted up, that you're a God who desires that we would just simply come and humble ourselves enough to let you love us. And so would you give us the courage to call out for help for your love? Would you continue to be at work in Justin's life and this ministry on Saturday morning and at work in our hearts today and our own places of, of sin and brokenness, of places of shame? Lord, may your love break in and set us free. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Justin. Can we give Justin a hand? Just grateful for his vulnerability and his sharing today.